Welcome to Media and Monuments Podcast, presented by Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Media and Monuments is conversations featuring industry pros speaking on a wide range of topics of interest to media makers. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for the first installment of our recurring segment, How I Got It Made. I am your host, Candace Block. Each month, I sit down with two different WIF members and chat with these filmmakers about one or two of their successfully completed projects. We discuss their journey and process as we delve into how they got it made. On this episode, I have a conversation with Robin Noonan Price. And after that, I talk with Mark Maxey. I'm here chatting with multifaceted media maker and a past WIF president, Robin Noonan Price. She is a producer and director that works not only in narrative formats, but in educational media production for Fairfax Public Schools as well. Today, we're going to chat with her about one of the award winning shorts that she directed as we explore more about how it got made. Hi, Robin. Thanks so much for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thank you for having me, Candice. This is so fun. So we're going to talk a lot more about Tell Me About Orange. But okay. before we get into that, I think the journey of every story is also the story of the people that came to create it. So let's let listeners get to know you and your background just a little bit more. How did you first get into this field? Like, when did you realize that filmmaking and, and visual storytelling was something you wanted to pursue? Actually, I went to grad school for film and video production at the American University, and it was a long time ago. <laughs> 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 and I was just so excited to just get into that program. And I had a very realistic view of, you know, Hollywood just might not be the place for me, but media and, and visual and storytelling was something I was really drawn to. After I graduated AU, I had moved down to Atlanta and I was working for like this really small, tiny little television station. And I did a bunch of different jobs for them. And then from there, I went to Augusta, Georgia, and I was working for a cable company and I did a lot of their commercials. So I wrote copy and then I sometimes I acted in them because there was a uh, <laughs> Nobody else around. And I, I got married. I had children. I lived overseas for a number of years. And then when we came back, I started doing like corporate video, weddings, that type of thing. And then in um, 2000, I landed at Fairfax County Public Schools. And it's just been an amazing career opportunity there. But I've always had that film, storytelling, television part of me. And when my girls were old enough and they all went off to college, that's when I really got back into filmmaking again. And it's because of WIP. It was great. So it sounds like you, by necessity as well, have dabbled in a lot of different aspects of filmmaking, as most people tend to do when starting out and especially in more indie realms. Are you focusing mostly on producing and directing now? Is that after trying different things where you want to stay? Yes. I think directing has been sort of, I loved it when I was in grad school. I stepped away from it for a while, but I really do love it. I love that collaborative part of filmmaking. And I also have realized that I'm not too bad at producing. I really am. I think you have to be really super organized. I have been doing a lot of producing as well. Those are the two, my two sweet spots, I would say. I also can edit. I'm not a great editor. I'm, I'm a basic, okay editor, but I, that's not really my strong suit. But if I had to edit, I could edit in a pinch. We're going to talk about one of the films that you did, a short, Tell Me About Orange, and you were the director on that. Before we talk about the story, since you said you've always liked this type of medium, was there any particular influence or inspiration? Were there any people that you aspired to, to be like? I would say when I was in graduate school, I wanted to be the female version of Steven Spielberg. I, I just loved his films and I loved the stories that he told. And I thought I want to do that, but as a woman. And at that point, there, you really didn't see a lot of, or I at least did not see a lot of women directors out there. So that that's important, again, in the whole seeing yourself in things and 
what makes WIF so great as well in terms of helping women be in all of the roles so people, little girls and whatnot can look up to women doing that as well. So yeah, so we're going to talk about 2020's short, Tell Me About Orange. And for listeners to get a better understanding before we get into the process a bit, tell us a little bit about what the, what the story is about. The story is a coming of age story. So it's about four friends and it's actually Elliot, who is a blind teen and his best friend, Abby, and they're best buds. And she has finally decided that she has a crush on him, but he has decided that he has a crush on somebody else and that somebody else is a person he's never seen because he's visually impaired, he can only hear that person's voice. Sounds really interesting that there's a lot of levels there. When did you realize that this was a story that you wanted to bring to the screen? Did you see the script at a certain point or did you seek it out or? I did. So how this came to me, and again, it all circles back to women in film and video. Every year before COVID, with hosted uh, a weekend long program called Script Deceit. And usually it's up at American University. It's like a a Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. Various tracks for producing, directing, films, a lot going on. And on usually on Sundays, people with scripts, maybe the first five pages of a script, they could get their scripts read and then they get feedback by a lot of industry professionals. My good friend, Jane Barbara, is one of the people that kind of started the all of Script DC. And she happened to be sitting in one of the seminars where they were scripts were being read. And she heard the script for Tell Me About Orange. And she was so excited. After she heard the script, she came running around to come and find me. And she said, I just heard this story that I love and I'm going to produce it and you're going to direct it. And I just looked at her and I said, Okay. (laughs) Can I read the script? I read the script. It was written by Rachel Amit, who is, she was brand new to WIF, I believe, and also brand new to script writing. And it was the, the folks that were in the room that heard the script said, wow, we really don't have a lot to tell you other than go make this film. And I don't think Rachel had any idea of how to do that. But Jane did. So Jane brought us all together and I read the script. I loved it. And then we had another producer, Malika Rollins, who was also new, a WIF person. Jane was the executive producer and Malika was the producer. And then we went about trying to find a crew. And we were very determined that we wanted to have a woman cinematographer. And so we found this wonderful person who also is a WIF member, Nasreen al And we started to look for our actors. And the first casting call that we had, we had a lot of girls and we didn't have a lot of boys. And because the role called for a visually impaired young teen male. We really wanted somebody that was visually impaired, a young teen male. And yeah. I was going to ask if you used people that really fit their traits of the character. Yeah. We tried very hard and it didn't happen. We, we couldn't find anybody right away. So we just, we tabled it. We just said, okay, we don't have the folks that we want. We're just going to wait a month or two and then put the casting notice out again. And Martha Carl, who's also a WIF member and an actor, she was the one that helped us with the casting. And she has a lot of connections. So she just threw out a big wide net everywhere. And um, we still could not come up with a visually impaired young person. But we did find some really good actors and we decided to go ahead and do that with them. So we, we had the casting call. We found this young man, Ian Topper, and he was amazing. Martha had a friend who works at a school for visually impaired students, and we worked with him to make sure that he knew how to use the cane. We had braille cards for him. We also had an actual consultant on the set who is visually impaired. So if we had questions about 
is he doing this correctly? This is what he's doing. She could tell us. So we tried our very best to make the representation as true as possible. That's wonderful. It sounds like you you really tried to get a, a visually impaired kid. Short of that, you did quite a good job. It sounds like making sure everything was authentic as, as much as so as possible. I guess then you didn't have to make accommodations on the set for someone who was actually visually impaired. But what were some differences that you found in working with younger actors in like these ages compared to projects you've done maybe with primarily adults? Actually, I absolutely loved working with young actors. And my job with the school system has me doing a lot of work with young people. So for me, it was, I was super comfortable with them. I think I'm more comfortable with younger people than I am with adults. I just have, I I had worked with so many people, young people through uh, the school system that it really wasn't that difficult. And they were just, oh my gosh, they were marvelous to work with. I didn't really have to give them a whole lot of acting notes. They they just really had this really wonderful connection with one another. And one of the young girls was more used to stage acting than film acting. And the two girls that are best friends in the film, they had never met one another before. But by the end of the scene that they did together, you would have thought that they knew each other forever. They were just having the best time. There's a scene where they're in the kitchen, they're baking cookies, they're just talking about this guy that Abby all of a sudden has decided she has feelings for, but maybe she doesn't. And then we had them in an alley just goofing around on a skateboard and they were just laughing and having the best time together. And so all of the kids really just, they just gelled. It was really neat to see. That's wonderful. Yeah. Sounds like really great chemistry and some genuine friendships born from this production. Yeah. I think they were really planning on like keeping in touch. They're all very interested in getting into film um, production and stage production. So I think they're all they're going to probably stay in touch. <laughs> Are they, were they all local? Did you do this locally? Yes, we did this locally. As a matter of fact, I had just moved into this house in Alexandria and it was my kitchen, one of the bedrooms, my backyard, the back alley. <laughs> that was all filmed. We did all of the, the house shots on one day. And then the next day we were over at a synagogue in Northwest DC. And we had, we shot a couple of scenes there. So it sounds like at least for the house stuff, you didn't have to worry so much about permitting and what all of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> also a nice benefit. Yeah. As everyone knows, all these productions are team efforts. Do you work with a lot of the same people time and time again? Like you have your trusted collaborators already set and then looking back, who are some of the great new additions to this one? Oh, wow. First of all, kudos to Rachel for coming up with the script in the first place. I mean, that she was a a newcomer to all of it. I had not worked with Nesreen before. And after Tell Me About Orange, I worked on another film as a producer for Shoshana Rosenbaum, who's also a WIF member. And Shoshana was looking for a cinematographer. And I was like, ooh, I know someone. So I worked with Nesreen again on, on the next, it was, it's called Night Waking and that was Shoshana's film. And I had worked with Shoshana a number of times, probably, I think I've worked on at least four of her films. So that's one person that we kind of gravitate to, towards one another. Jane Barbara, of course, Jane and I have worked on oof, at least five or six shorts. And through Jane, I had met Sherry Stroud. I've worked on a number of Sherry's films. So we've all like sort of worked together when we have projects. So I have a really great pool of people to call on. Sounds like a wonderful established network. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And because you're trying to get something done, especially with shorts, you're very limited by time and you're very limited by money. And you really want to make sure that I mean, at least for me, you're working really hard, but you should have fun too. Like that collaboration part should really be, it shouldn't be a stressful experience. It should be a really fun and 
joyful experience, even though you're working long days and you're tired or whatever. But so with all those folks, I'm, it, it's always been that way. We've had such a great time, despite the fact that we've been, oh my gosh, like in the middle of the night, sometimes freezing cold, other different yeah, the friendships help you get through it all. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. When people think about chemistry, sometimes only think about between actors on screen, but there's a whole chemistry of a crew and the family that collaborates on each project. Speaking of shorts and how they are their own thing, is this, do you want to stick with shorts or do you see yourself doing longer formats eventually? I would love to work on a feature. That really would be such a joy for me and the goal of mine. I think it's just really dependent on what's out there. And again, it all goes back to budget. If there's something that we can, that we can finance and get it done. And the other piece of that is a lot of the shorts we're working in and around on weekends or every once in a while, I take time off from my full-time job. So I know for a feature, I'm going to have to really plan ahead for that one. If, uh, you know, a longer commitment and also you need to, a good chunk of time, but I think it would be so cool. And I know, I know Jane has, goodness, she's got three or four features in her back pocket. I'm like, <laughs> come on, let's go. <laughs> Sounds like you ladies are always making stuff. It's great. As a director, because you, you were directing on this and you want to do more directing, what is it that you want people to feel like if you were to ask someone on your crew or whatever, what your particular style of a director is from all perspectives, is there something that you aim to do? What do you want people to say as how they would describe you as a director? I think people would say that I'm I'm a collaborator. I really do like to listen to what other people have to say and get their thoughts and ideas. But at the end of the day, ultimately, it stops with me. Like I've got to make fundamental decisions and uh, I've got to keep things moving along. But I do love that collaboration. I really think it's just when everybody's humming together and they're like, oh, we got to take. But then it's like, what if we filmed it this way? Nesreen was amazing in some of the ways that she constructed the shots. Like she had some really cool tracking shots. And she had this one, this elaborate, gosh, she had the camera up, like basically up in the air, facing down as the actor is lying on a bed, just watching his cell phone. And it just was like this really gorgeous track right up to his face. And things like that are just so neat to work with somebody. And to get that collaboration. As you said earlier, that like Spielberg was an inspiration and stuff as well. And people know different directors as their styles and they can say this is a so-and-so's piece. Do you hope to have a little bit of a, a style where people would say, oh, this looks like it's a Noonan Price film? Do you know what you want that to be or do you think it might happen organically? That's a great question. And I've not directed enough films, but I do think that I gravitate a lot towards maybe comedy, dramedy type of a thing. I'm trying to think. I've directed 48-hour films. I I think there's always been an element of quirky. Mm -hmm. Quirky and, is nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, quirky. And then also just fun, a little bit of humor in the the pieces that I do. So yeah, maybe that is a style thing. As you've been doing more, you say you're starting to do more directing now. What are some of the things that you learned from earlier projects that you applied to this one? And what do you think you learned from this one that you might apply to subsequent ones? Script DC, we had a director, her name is Joan Darling, that I have taken numerous directing classes with. And she is somebody that uses a lot of what she calls sense memory with her actors. But she also likes to try to get her actors to do things spontaneously. And, and she likes, she's very playful in the way that she likes to direct. And so I, I had been thinking about this one scene. The girls were in the kitchen. They were baking cookies. And I sidled up to one of the, the girls and I said, in this next scene, I want you to just dip your hand into the cookie batter and just go Bleh. like you're responding to your friend who's saying you boys basically make me vomit. And the other girl the other actor did not know that this was going to happen. And when it did, it was just so funny. Like she burst out laughing and it was so genuine. 
So those are some of the things like that was something I, I learned that I really liked to heart and applied. And I, I just loved the way that turned out. I just was just really, oh my gosh, that worked. And I have to keep that little trick in my back pocket. Sounds like it was a really fun shoot, especially that day. <laughs> It was. And then on some of the other films I've worked on, (laughs) we've had, oh my goodness, there's always something that, that it's, it goes wrong. And so there's always a lot of problem solving. Oh my gosh, that just happened. Now we have to do this. But I've worked with animals in the past. And honestly, it's always, you just never know what you're going to get. And even though I've worked with two, two folks that have, are, on films that were professional animal trainers, whew, it, that was a little dicey. So. <laughs> <laughs> so kids, you've got down. Animals, are, still not maybe your favorite. <laughs> animals are tricky. Actually, the animals are usually fine. It's the trainers that are Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So looking back on this film about Tell Me About Orange, is there like a, a memory or story that's going to stick out when you think back on this film as that is like something that sort of encapsulates this time? We were really under pressure. We had two days to get this film done. And I think I told you the second day we were at a temple in D.C. and we had a really hard out at five o'clock. And it just the setups were taking long. There was a camp that was going on that we were unaware of. So there was a lot of kids running in and out of the building. There was a lot of noise. So that kind of threw our schedule off a little bit. And so we were trying to get this one last scene shot. We were outside shooting it because we were just like, okay, we've got to get everything inside. Then we got to get outside and get this one scene. And it was an important scene to get. And I ran into the building and it was like five minutes to five. I ran outside. I made everybody stop. And I said, oh my gosh, you guys get everything out of the building. And we literally were like hauling all the equipment outside and we had to pack everything up in the parking lot. Like it was just, it was so stressful. So that kind of encapsulated that day. Well, now you know how fast you can do it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So once this was uh, completed and you shifted to, to getting it into festivals and everything, were there particular festivals that you had in mind going into it, especially with things like a blind character? I actually was looking for festivals that were women-centric, number one. We got into the Bentonville Film Festival and they were looking for women directors, women producers, like the more women-centric crew people. We just got into the Los Angeles International Women's Film Festival, which is coming up at the end of March. I'm super excited about that. But we also... Part of the story has a sort of an LGBTQ theme to it as well. When I was picking festivals, I was looking um, for places that kind of cater to those types of genres as well. So far, we've gotten into 13 festivals, which has been super exciting. And one of the festivals, I really didn't have any expectation, but I just submitted anyway. It was the rap women stars had a competition and we were one of the six finalists. It's a high compliment. Yes. Yeah, it really was. That's great. That's really encouraging. It also goes to show just submit anyway, because if you're not that confident about it, what's the worst that could happen? You could, you know, do better than you think as well. Yeah. There are other marketing and stuff that went into this. If someone wanted to get into filmmaking, what's a piece of advice you would give them? I would say just go for it. I I really honestly, you just have to put yourself out there. And you really also have to have a little bit of a thick skin because not everybody is going to like what your vision is or what you've done. And you can't worry too much about that. You could take constructive criticism and make things better. But I just think that if it's a passion that you have, it's something you really ought to just go for and try and women in film and video, I'm giving them a big plug. Honestly, so many people have started out just that way, starting to write scripts and then getting them read and getting constructive feedback. And there's, WIF really does provide a lot of opportunities for emerging filmmakers and for seasoned filmmakers. So I, I can't say enough wonderful things about them. And 
One more thing I wanted to mention about Tell Me About Orange. We received a grant through WIF. The Narrative Shorts Finishing Fund? Yes. The grant gave us money to help finish the film up. We paid our editor initially, but then we obviously have to finish the project. So we have money to pay the editor. We got this amazing sound design. We have got amazing color correction and titling. And then the other piece of it was we had a little bit of money left over. So we were able to add music with member Liza Figueroa was our composer and she it's all original music that she composed for us. And it was it just made the film. Wow. It's, it sounds like, you know, when people say filming in New York or something, that's a character itself. It sounds like Whiff was a, was a major player in, oh, yeah. in getting this Absolutely. made as well. Whiff was a definite like MVP of this. Absolutely. If someone wants to learn more about projects that you're working on or this one more specifically. People can email me once we get Orange out of the festival run, then I'll have a, a place where it can live and people can actually watch it. It sounds like that is something that WIF will let people know when that is up and ready to go. Yes. Everyone keep your eyes peeled. There will be more about Tell Me About Orange down the line <laughs> and how you can see it. Thanks so much for, for chatting with me. I appreciate it so much. I really, it, this is really great. I'm here chatting with Mark Maxey, an award-winning producer and executive vice president of Rolling Pictures. Though he's also written and directed, he primarily produces and has produced and executive produced several projects spanning television and film, short form and long, documentary and narrative. Today, we're going to look specifically at some of his uh, more recent projects as we learn more about how he got them made. Thanks so much for joining us today and welcome to the podcast. My pleasure. We're going to focus more specifically about one of your more recent documentaries that you wrote, produced and directed up to snuff. And then talk a little bit more about some of your more recent narratives that you were a producer on. But before that, let's just get to know you a little bit more. How did you get into producing? When did you first realize that visual storytelling was the world you wanted to work within? I've always loved film. I'm not sure that my path here was the traditional path. I didn't grow up making movies in my backyard with my friends. Didn't dream of being Spielberg or George Lucas the way. You know, other people did. Film wasn't what I pursued in school. I was much more into music, I think, than I was into the visual arts, but I always had a fascination with and appreciation for the visual arts and found my way to working for a production company and producing content for other people and then got involved with the film festival that I helped start and, and I'm still actively involved with and started meeting these other incredible filmmakers and storytellers and, and realized that, you know, that's, that's really what I want to do is, is focus on you know, finding and sharing compelling stories with audiences. Let's talk about a couple of them more specifically. First, I guess the older one, because it was in 2018, I believe it was released, Up to Snuff. You were the producer, writer, and director of that. So you had a lot more hand in that one, which is great because we'll, I guess, get to see the differences between that versus just producing. And that is the, the story of the gifted and prolific musician and composer, Snuffy Walden, who a lot of people might not realize, but is the, the composer behind a lot of very iconic television series. You, you mentioned you were into music. Is that part of what inspired you to want to get this piece made? Yes, I had met Snuffy through, through a film festival, actually, where he was, I invited him to come do a, a master class on the art of scoring for a picture. He was gracious enough to, to come and we became friends. And, and as we got to know each other, he has this fascinating backstory. He's better known as a television composer, as you said, and he, he wrote the music for iconic shows like The West Wing and Wonder Years, 30-something Friday Night Lights, Nashville, all shows that have just really strong connections to music th throughout, as well as all kinds of other uh, shows that he worked on, but those specifically. For the people that love The West Wing, you hear the theme of The West Wing, and it evokes a, a feeling or 30-something. It's the same way. So I was just fascinated by that. And he's such a fascinating guy. And so we became friends through that experience. Um, my wife and I like Aaron Sorkin's writing. And Snuffy had worked with him on three out of the four television shows that Aaron Sorkin run, produced, starting with Sports Night and the West Wing, of course, and, and Studio 60. There was a show, the one show that Snuffy didn't do was a show called The Newsroom. And I'd taken my wife out to sit in the studio for a taping of an episode of that at Sunset Gower Studios, where they were filming that series for HBO. And Aaron Sorkin sat down next to us while we were uh, on set and was very friendly. And when I mentioned that we're friends with Snuffy Walden, he lit up and started telling us stories about Snuffy. 
And that was the moment for me that I thought, you know, if Eric Sorkin reacts that way to Snuffy's name, wouldn't it be fun to go around and talk to other people that Snuffy's worked with throughout his career and, and see what their stories are? And so that was the genesis for what became the Up to Snuff documentary. Um, we'd started that in 2017. And as you mentioned, by 2018, that was wrapped and, and we hit the festival circuit. We're in 60 festivals with that film. It was a lot of fun. You've had a hand in different versions of, you know, whether it's a contributing producer, a producer, an executive producer. How would you describe the differences between each of those roles? Producing is one of those roles that it's nebulous and hard to explain. No one's really sure what a producer does. The way I, I think of it, and it, it's actually a little different in television versus film. In television, an executive producer is often the, the showrunner and the head writer for a series. I'm an executive producer for feature films is generally someone who's a financier or helps in some way move the project forward. I spend more more time as just a producing producer. I guess the way to explain it is that for you know, filmmaking this is a collaborative process, right? It takes a, a lot of people to make a film. And each of those people has a specific role that they play at a different point in production. So there's people involved in the costumes or the actors or the, the director, or you have the editors that, that put it all together. The producer is the person who's there from concept to completion. They're there from the beginning. Oftentimes I'm acquiring a screenplay. I'm finding and hiring the director. I'm raising the money and getting the cast attached to the project uh, to get it off the ground. And then you have all those people that do all their respective roles throughout production and into post-production. And then the producer is often involved. And then on the back end of that, I'm actually getting the film distributed and, and getting it out to the world. So... But when you watch the Oscars, when the Oscar is given for best picture, it's handed to the producer for the film. Uh, with Up to Snuff, you were the writer, producer and director. You were many of those elements. But who else did you bring on board? And what was your process like in finding, you know, who might you, you know, DP or cinematographer or anything like that be? So that was very much a, a passion project and, and a labor of love. And Snuffy and I were friends and I just loved his music and, and the subject matter that the people that we were interviewing for the film included Aaron Sorkin and people like Martin Sheen and Tom Arnold and Fred Savage and all these other people, Lawrence O'Donnell. It's just an amazing group of people and musicians from bands like The Who and Journey and Toto and Chicago and, and others. It was a lot of fun to do. The director of photography, the editors, and most of my crew were all people I had worked with through the production company. These are guys that I, I've known and worked with for years. It was very much an in-house production in that set. And for that, I, I traveled with the crew. So we filmed in California, New York, and London, and, and all over. And oftentimes you fly in with maybe your director of photography and then just put together a local crew. But for this, we wanted to tell the story with our team. So we actually traveled. Our editor was with us while we were shooting. So he was logging shots. And by the time we got into post, he already had a pretty good idea of these were these golden moments or these great stories or these wonderful different reveals that we could incorporate into the film. It was also pre-pandemic, so traveling was easier. But yes. Yeah, we, we did that at the right time. And, and we did it. And we were pretty efficient with that. I know people will t spend years making a documentary film, and I just I don't have the patience for that. I think that the time it takes to complete a task is equal to the time that you have to complete the task. It will expand. If you have, you know, a year to get it done, it'll take a year. If you have a month to get it done, it'll take a month. So we started shooting that in, in May. And by the end of August, we had wrapped principal photography. And by October, we had a rough cut and did an audience test screening in a theater and, and then released the film, uh, premiered the film the following March of the following year. Do you think Snuffy being such a beloved uh, person helped with just it being really easy to get people to want to chat about him? Have you had experiences where it's not so easy to get people? I was amazed at the people that wanted to be part of this story and the people I named it and so many others. We did maybe 30 interviews for this film and, e and each person that we interviewed was someone important and iconic in, in their own respective field, other musicians, composers, actors, producers, directors, or friends of his. And it was uh, it was amazing to me that we were able to get the people that we got. And I think that's a testament to who Snuffy is and just how beloved he is. If, if you know him or have worked with him, people heard that we were telling his story and they said, how can I help? How can I be a service? What could they do for us? Which was really remarkable. I, I thought it would be much harder than it turned out to be. That's all Snuffy. That's the magic of who he is as a person, and just how much he's done for other people. That's wonderful. And yeah, you sat down with him more than once by the looks of the 
film? Yeah, we did. So I did a lot of research. I mean, that's the other thing is just because it's unscripted doesn't mean that it's unstructured. So I had a good sense of what the story was I wanted to tell before we ever started filming. And then we were always open to new things that would come up that that we weren't aware of. I, I jokingly said as we were in England filming, he'd spent a lot of time in England in the 70s before he was married. And I jokingly hoped that we'd find some illegitimate child <laughs> that he had and all of a sudden yeah. became a father-child uh, <laughs> reunion story. Fortunately or unfortunately, you know, no illegitimate children appeared while we were filming. But but it was very much a story of, of kind of his journey through music and a story of redemption. In the 70s, he was touring with bands like Emerson, Lake and Palmer and recording with Stevie Wonder and touring with Shaka Khan or Eric Burden and the Animals. All big acts in that era. And this is the sex, drugs, rock and roll era of the 70s and, and 80s before cell phones and, and paparazzi and AIDS and, and the things that have curtailed a lot of those excesses. So he was on this journey and 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 was enjoying these excesses and, and, and hit a point where he had to choose a path forward and he chose sobriety, which meant he couldn't go back out on the road as a guitar player. He'd fall right back into that lifestyle that he was trying to distance himself from. So he kind of had to reinvent himself as a composer, which is what led to his career as one of the most prolific composers in, in television history. And that journey was it's just it's a fascinating journey, at least to me. And, and the people that we met along the way knew him at different stages. The guys from Toto were the Who knew a different Snuffy. They knew the, the drinking, partying, touring guitar player. And Aaron Sorkin knew this very gentle, sweet composer guy who was writing orchestral scores for the West Wing. They all had a different perspective, and it was fun to, to hear all those stories and they put together through his journey who this man is. He's a pretty, pretty humble person who doesn't really like to look at a lot of the stuff he's been involved in. Do you know if he's seen the, the documentary? He has. So he came to the premiere and sat next to me and just dug his <laughs> nails under my knee. Which is not it. personal, I'm sure, <laughs> to the piece. <laughs> it's no. not a reflection of the work. Yeah. Yeah. He is just such a kind and, and humble person. And, and that was one of the bigger challenges for me just to even start that, the project. When I said, hey, Snuffy, I want to tell your story. He's like, oh, no one wants to see my story. He did not want to be in front of the camera at all. And I guess that, that, that goes to your question. So we did interview him more than once, in part because I wanted to get all these stories and then get him to add or reflect or, or embellish a bit. But then also we knew we wanted to have him in the studio, you know, mixing a show or playing guitar. And so we did. We filmed him at a couple points throughout. He was one of the people that traveled with me. So even though he wasn't part of the interviews with all of these people, I wanted him in the room more for the people I, I was interviewing than, than for him, because I figured they'd speak more freely about him if he were there. And it would be it give them permission to, to tell the stories, not all of which were, were flattering. He struggled with some um, you know, alcohol and, and some other demons during those 70s and, and 80s decades. And I wanted this to be a very real look at who he is, not just a, a fiery puff piece. That was a documentary, but you've also done producing for narratives. And you, we talked a little bit about the difference of TV versus film. What's the main difference between doing more of a documentary versus a narrative? Yeah, it's, it's just a, a different approach to, to storytelling. With a documentary, you're talking to the people that were involved or trying to find footage of the events or photos to help illustrate what, what it is that you're, you're sharing with the audience. And with a narrative film, you get to write it and script it and cast the right people in the roles and, and recreate those. It's just a very different approach to, to, to storytelling. And they each are, are fun in, in different ways. I loved making the documentary and talking to, to the people involved in that story and the other stories that I've been fortunate enough to be part of. And then with the narrative films, I love you know finding a screenplay or, or reading something and then seeing it brought to life by incredible actors. You have a much larger crew on a feature film than you would on a documentary, 10 people, and for the Up to Snuff film, and that was large. Some documentary crews are just two or three people going out doing the interview. So the fact that we had 10 was a bit of a luxury. If you do a, a narrative film, you could have 80 or 100 or hundreds, depending on what type of, of a feature you're shooting. I was involved with three, three feature films last year, all of which were narrative features, and each very different from each other, a comedy and kind of a drama. And, it's more of a mainstream kind of story. And they were each you know, amazing experiences in and of themselves. And I'm excited to have all three be released this year where people could watch them and see them. So, What are the ones that are, are coming out that you think people are going to 
be able to see this year? I had the good fortune of being able to be part of uh, Mayan Bialik's directorial debut. It's a film called As They Made Us. It's very autobiographical for her. It's about her family and childhood. Her father was a documentary filmmaker who had some issues and, and was somewhat abusive uh, to his kids. And her mother was someone of a self-medicating alcoholic that allowed that to happen. So this is a very personal story for, for Mayim to share. And we had Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen cast as her parents. We had Simon Helberg from her show. I don't know if uh, people are familiar with Mayim. She was on The Big Bang Theory. She was Blossom as a yeah. child. Um, I think well, she's uh, gotten back resurgence. She has a, another show out now. And then with all the Jeopardy stuff too, I think she's a lot more back in pop culture yes. currently. No, so, she's, yeah. <laughs> she's amazing. Simon Helberg, who would been part of the cast on The Big Bang Theory with her, played her brother in the film, and then Diana Agron, who had been one of the stars of the show Glee, played Mayim. And it was, you know, it's a, it's a very heavy story about, about this family. And then as you age, the man who was an intimidating figure when you were a child, fast forward 40 years, and now he's near the end of his life, and you're an adult, and how does that change? And the power dynamic or the relationship, it was really an incredible journey to be on with her as she worked through the story and shared it with the audience. And Dustin and Candace and Simon and Diana were just incredible um, actors in this role. That was a lot of fun. So that'll be out this year. And then very different. I went from that film to a, a film directed by Kira Sedgwick that starred Kevin Bacon and Carrie Preston and Maddie Brewer and um, Alexander Shipp and Kyle Allen, who each were just incredible uh, and amazing in their own. And collectively, it was just like the dream cast for a very different kind of story in a film called Space Oddity, which is, I mean, at its heart, kind of a love story. It, we, we shot the whole thing at a flower farm in Rhode Island. So it was visually the stunning, beautiful setting. Rhode Island is an amazing state, uh, which to work. And this farm was just beautiful. And, and the story loosely centers around a man who is dedicate himself to growing things and dreams of being one of the first colonists to go to Mars and start plant life in a new world. And as he's preparing for that, meets a girl and falls in love and has to choose between does he follow his dream or follow his heart. Mm. Nutshell, that's that space oddity. Written by Rebecca Manor, who's become a good friend, who's just a brilliant a screenwriter. And just everything about that was a it was just, it was a wonderful experience. Was your connection to, for example, like the screenwriter, part of what pulled you into that project? Filmmaking is, is very much a, a, a networking business. Someone that told someone about me and that's how I got involved. And then you do one film with someone and then all of a sudden, you know, people that you'd worked with in the past or doing something else until you get pulled into other things. I'm very fortunate to have found my way to those groups of people. Those were not the first collaborations, and we have other things now planned for this year and beyond where a lot of the same people will be involved. Not necessarily the same actors, but certainly writers or directors or crew are all looking for ways to continue the collaboration because we just had such a terrific time on those helps. You've developed, uh, it sounds like, a bunch of people that you like working with time and time again. Do you like always, or in addition, bringing in new people for fresh blood and perspectives and all of that on each new project as well? A absolutely. And... Each of the films that, that I've, I've made, we've filmed a different location. So there's certain key people that you like to have with you when you start a project. But then to the extent that you can, you also want to pull in people in whatever area you're filming. So we had a, a, a large Indian crew from Rhode Island or the New England area for Space Oddity. We filmed Mimes movie in New Jersey. So we had a very different crew that we pulled in from New York and New Jersey for that. The production designer or the unit production manager or the composer, certain keys that I look forward to working with again. And there are people that I want involved in every production that I do just because I, I, I trust them and know them and, and they I and it's, it's just kind of collaborative experience. So. so speaking of the different locations, how involved are you in finding locations and, and things like that or choosing final locations? The producers uh, involved definitely in choosing where things get filmed in terms of the state or the country. And a lot of that's driven by what supports the, the story itself and then what has some kind of incentive that helps get the whole film put together. New Jersey, for example, had a very, had a very favorable film incentive program, a tax incentive for filmmakers that were going to work in the state. And that was one of the factors that, that helped us choose that over other places. 
I have a friend and colleague who films a lot in Puerto Rico because they have a 40% tax credit down there and, and an amazing crew as well. And so she finds stories that, that work in that type of a setting and is able to leverage incentives available to them. So in terms of once you've found the region or the state or the country where you want to film, then there's location managers and then the film office for, for those locations that'll you have to find, all right, I need this type of a church or a school or a park or a building or whatever it is, a waterfall, whatever the script calls for, then there are people on the ground that'll go scout and, and come back and present, all right, here's all your choices for for these types of elements and, and we'll narrow down to where you film specifically. But, you know, the producer's definitely involved in, in choosing at a high level. Okay, we're going to do this. Right, and, and also thinking about the money and all Yeah, that it, well. it all comes together. No, it's, uh, for example, there's a lot of things that the film in Canada, because there's places in Canada that double for New York and it's easier and, and less expensive than trying to shut down the street in Manhattan. We do the same thing in Vancouver and it'll look just about the same on camera. A lot of those decisions go into selecting locations for where things are filmed. So, Was there anything that you, you know, learned on these particular pieces that you're hoping to take forward into future ones, or is it just more contacts or are you still, you're still constantly growing and learning, I'm assuming? Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. I learned early on that if you surround yourself with people more talented than you, all boats rise with the tide and they, they make me look you know better than I am. And part of the fun of that is that I'm always learning new things from the people I work with or, or the different projects that we do. That's what's made doing the, the narrative features fun because it is such a different process in the doc documentaries. And so that's a different approach to, to storytelling. Um, and doing things in the studio versus on location is very different. Doing different types of films. And one of the films that I have coming up that we'll be filming this year is a horror film, which I haven't done a lot of. And it's, so I'm excited about that. I was just in a meeting last week with the, in the creature shop with the, the special effects wizard who's going to create all these incredible special effects. Oh, so jealous. Uh, That's, yeah. I love that stuff. <laughs> it, it's a lot of fun. And, and again, hasn't been part of, of what I've done uh, previously. Every project has an opportunity to grow as a as an artist or, or a person in some way. Do you think that drives choosing each of your neat, uh, next pieces, doing something you hadn't done before? Is that a big factor? For me, I mean, there are people that all they do is horror films or they have a, a style. Blumhouse film looks like a Blumhouse film. Or if you go to a Quentin Tarantino film, what you're getting yeah. is a different story, but it's all a very similar aesthetic and pace. I'm not someone who has that type of a lane that I want to stay in. The drama, the romance, the, I have a comedy that we're going to be doing this year, horror. Um, you want to drive all the lanes and some off-roading. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to, yes, I'm all about a varied experience and a diverse you know, body of work, which is, I think, more fun for me. I don't want to do the same thing every time. I don't want it to look like the last one. And I've been fortunate to this point to be able to sustain that. Do you um, like to focus on one project at a time? You always have 10 projects, you know, in development at once because uh, at, at any given point, something could fall off or something could, could connect and fall into place. I was involved with three productions last year and we have four scheduled for this year. I like to be on location for, for the productions I, I'm part of. I, I know producers that have so many things going on at once that they drop in and check in on things and then bop out to the next one. I prefer to be more involved in the productions and be on location during the production, even though if a producer's done their job, you shouldn't have anything to do during the production except maybe do uh Say no overtime, you know, no second meal. But as a rule, if you've done your job well and you have the right team built around you, everyone knows how to execute uh, their respective part of a production. I always have 10 projects that I'm in various stages of development, but ideally I'd have one a quarter that I could focus on in terms of my time being present for this production. So, How and when did you get involved with rolling pictures? Uh, around the time that we did uh, Up to Snuff, where I'd been involved with the film festival and, and was just inspired to go you know, tell stories that I was excited about rather than just telling other people's stories. It's great to go do those things, but it's not necessarily the things that you're passionate about. And I didn't want my next 20 years to look like the previous 20 years. So I, that's, I think, the point where, where Rolling Pictures came into existence because that's the company that's Rolling Pictures' sole focus is films, documentaries, features, television, film. But telling those types of stories, it's, you know, the things that I'm excited about when I get up in the morning. Uh, speaking of, I think that's where you can find some of these documentaries and things and links and the, the projects you're working on. And if you go to Rolling, what's the website? 
Yeah, it's rollingpictures.com is the company site, and um, not every project that we're involved with is uh, on that site. The things that are in uh, in post-production now or in in, in production now um, aren't necessarily there, but certainly the films that are already finished, or there's a bunch of different documentaries we've been involved with and other types of films that we're developing or is some television projects as well. Rollingpictures.com. For someone that might be starting out and eager to look into becoming a producer or anything like that. What are some of the like harsh realities or dark sides that you hope someone had let you know about? And then also on the flip of that, what are some of the best, most exciting parts of being a producer? The biggest thing is, is network. I mean, someone early on told me, and again, I'm old. I don't know that Rolodexes are a thing now. Back when I was first starting out, someone who kind of mentored me said that the most valuable asset was his Rolodex. It was the people he knew. And that, that stuck with me early on. So I've always... You know, try to network and connect with people. And I think that's hugely important. So for someone wanting to get involved in film, regardless of whether you want to direct or edit or produce or, or whatever role you want to be in, if you're just getting started, go be a production assistant. Get involved. Meet other people. Learn the lingo. Spend time at a radio locking up a location or, or doing the things that production assistants are asked to do. It's just a great way to indoctrinate yourself into the process and the workflow and what the different positions are when you make a film. And then a lot of those people that you meet are people that will be helpful down the road. So the person who was someone's assistant today may be the hiring manager in a production tomorrow. One of the most prolific producers in Hollywood is Kathleen Kennedy, who is now the president of Lucasfilm at Disney. But Steven Spielberg hired her as a secretary, you know, at the beginning of her career. She was the secretary. And as he tells it, not even a very good one in terms of paying a secretary. But she was so good at the storytelling and the relationships and production management that she worked under him and then worked with him and is now the second highest grossing producer in Hollywood. Yeah, you never know who you're going to be working with down the road. So definitely get involved, definitely network, show up in time, be decent to people, treat everyone well, do what they asked of you. And people want to work with the people that they know and trust. So if you deliver for people, that, that's the great way to get started. So. If I could add one more word of advice for, sure. for you know people interested in getting involved with film, there's there are great organizations out there as well that you could get involved with women in film and video. I'm on the board of Women in Film and Video, which is the Mid-Atlantic uh, chapter of that organization. It's just a wonderful organization. Every state has something similar to that. There's production alliances, there's meetups, there's all kinds of groups of people that they can gather and get excited about about film there's a 48 hour film festival where it puts groups of people together in a very short accelerated period of time to go tell a story and that's a great way to get involved and so there's a lot of things you could do the important thing is to find other like-minded people and actually go do it the best way to to make a film is is to to go make a film yeah it's an accessible thing regardless of who you are or where you live i live on the east coast i'm not in hollywood i love what i do every day when i get up Thank you so much for for chatting with us today. And I'm excited to see that that new stuff come out. Thank you, Candice. That's it for this installment of How I Got It Made. I hope you've gained some valuable insights from our wonderful guests. Until next month, enjoy the continued weekly content from Media and Monuments. Thank you for listening to Media and Monuments, a service of women in film and video in Washington, D.C., Please remember to review, rate, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. For more information about WIF, please visit our website at wif as in Frank, v as in Victor, dot org.